Welcome to Mega 10, Brad and Monica here. A quick reminder, please give us a like and hit the bell of video and subscribe our channel. Thank you for watching and support. All right, let's unpack this. Today, we're diving deep into some uh, really groundbreaking insights about how blockchain is actually integrating into traditional finance. Forget the hype, you know? We're looking at what's really happening on the ground, the big wins, the sneaky risks, and what it all means for you, our savvy listener, especially now here in Q3 of 2025. Yeah, what's truly fascinating, I think, is how much the conversation has shifted. It's really no longer about if blockchain will transform finance. It's much more about how and where it's already delivering, you know, measurable value. We'll try and connect the dots today between the investment happening, these operational shifts, and even some, frankly, surprising M&A activity. Tell the story. Okay, so our mission today is to cut through all that noise, give you the most important nuggets, and hopefully arm you with the surprising facts you need to feel genuinely well-informed about this landscape because it's moving fast. We've got quite a stack of insights ready to explore. So let's just dive right in. Are we seeing actual genuine business value from blockchain in traditional finance? Or is it still, you know, mostly proof of concept projects and a bit of PR? What really stands out to you in terms of tangible bottom line results? That's, uh, that's the critical question, isn't it? Is this real ROI? And the data we're seeing now lays out some clear KPIs showing real shifts, especially in cross-border settlements. I mean, we're talking about a pretty significant 30-40% cost reduction compared to the old legacy systems like SWIFT. 30-40%? to 40%. Yeah, that's not just marginal. That's money saved directly impacting the bottom lines. That's a huge difference. And what about the speed? We've all heard about transactions taking days and days. Exactly. Those legacy SWIFT payments, they can mm -hmm. take, what, two to five business days sometimes? But these blockchain solutions, like some of the ones from Ripple, they settle in seconds, literally three to five seconds. Wow. Just think about what that does for cash flow. For liquidity, especially for businesses operating globally, look at Santander's OnePay FX that's built on Ripple Tech. It cut their international payment processing from days down to mere seconds. Okay, that's a big name. It is. And then there's Trianglo, an SME payment specialist over in Malaysia. After they connected to RippleNet, their transaction volume just exploded. It jumped from around US $53 million to US $970 million. Wait, $970 million? Mm -hmm. That's a phenomenal 1,729% increase. Goodness. That's new business value, clear as day, not just a pilot program. Right. That really underlines it. These aren't just theories anymore. They're actual operational changes. And as you said, it's not just about saving money on the old ways of doing things. The report hints at entirely new revenue streams opening up, right? Absolutely. And this is where it gets really interesting for the long term, I think. Tokenization. It's opening up completely new fee streams for banks, asset managers. We're seeing BlackRock's tokenized money market fund. It's already got, what, U.S. $1 billion under management. And Franklin Templeton's got one, too, around U.S. $380 million. Yeah. And the projections, they suggest tokenized assets could grow from maybe U.S. sell point six trillion dollars today to somewhere around U.S. $18.9 trillion by 2033. $18.9 trillion. That's the forecast. So this isn't just efficiency tweaking. It's potentially a fundamental shift in how assets are managed, traded, fractionalized. It's big. Okay, so the numbers are definitely impressive. But let's talk about who. Who are the big players actually, you know, moving the needle here? Are these still isolated experiments or are we seeing genuine large-scale deployments? Well, connecting this to the bigger picture, the report does highlight several global banks and payment firms that are now in operational use, really past the pilot stage. Santander, as I mentioned, is a prime example. Mm. Their one pay FX handles up to 50% of their international payment volume. 50%? Wow. Yeah, that's real production level adoption. Shows the tech is ready for prime time in finance. SBI Remit in Japan is another one. They're actively using RippleNet for remittances into Southeast Asia. They're seeing reduced fees and settlement in seconds. And it's expanding beyond just remittances, isn't it? We're seeing blockchain used for more complex stuff now. Oh, definitely. Not at all just remittances. Look at JP Morgan's JPM coin. It's processing over a billion US dollars in daily transaction value now. A billion a day. Mm -hmm. And they're using it with Ant International for 247 cross-border treasury transfers. Think about that, it directly reduces funding costs and liquidity risks for their large corporate clients. So that's about automating complex treasury operations. Exactly. Moving beyond simple payments to improve balance sheet efficiency. Even American Express has implemented Ripple's technology for B2B payments, business to business, improving settlement times for their commercial customers. These are scalable commercial wins. Right. They prove the operational viability and, frankly, the competitive edge over the old ways. 
So yeah, it definitely sounds like we're well past the proof of concept stage in quite a few key areas. Remember to subscribe. Okay. Now, when we talk blockchain and finance, Ripple's name comes up a lot, obviously. But they're definitely not the only game in town. What does that competitive landscape look like, and how do their approaches differ, especially for investors watching this space? It's uh, it's a really dynamic space, very diverse. You've got Ripple, yes, with its XRP ledger and ODL on-demand liquidity. Their specialty is cross-border payments, focus on speed, low fees, and they lean towards a more public liquid approach. Plus, they have, what, over 60 regulatory licenses globally? Yeah. That's a big deal. That's a significant moat. But there are other big names taking different routes, right? Yes, absolutely. Take R3 Corda. It's designed specifically for financial services. Big emphasis on privacy at the transaction level. Yeah. It's really emerged as a leader in RWA tokenization, real-world asset tokenization. Okay, putting things like real estate on the blockchain. Exactly. <laughs> or commodities, other tangible assets. They already have over U.S. $10 billion in assets live on-chain. A key example is the Spunda Banca DLT network in Italy. Over 100 banks use it for interbank reconciliation. And interestingly, R3 just announced a partnership with Solana to bridge their private Corda networks to public blockchains. Hmm, that signals a shift. What about Hyperledger? Where do they fit in? Hyperledger Fabric is different again. It's an open source framework, very modular, permissioned meaning access is controlled, hmm. backed by the Linux Foundation. You see it used broadly across different industries, not just finance. Trade finance is a big one. Like the GSBN network, processing over a million shipments. It cut cargo release times from days down to hours using Hyperledger. So more industry-specific consortia. Often, yes. Very robust for complex supply chains and things like that. And then you have the big banks building their own solutions. More proprietary stuff. Right. JPM Coin, running on Quorum Technology, it's the prime example there. Bank-native approach. Processing, as we said, over a billion dollars daily just for JP Morgan's own corporate clients, focusing on programmable treasuries, 247 payments within their ecosystem. Okay. But what's really insightful, I think, is JP Morgan's recent partnership with Coinbase that was just announced July 2025. The one allowing Chase retail customers. Exactly. To link accounts and fund crypto purchases directly. That's a major incumbent strategically embracing public chain infrastructure. Interesting. It really highlights this fundamental strategic divergence. You know, you have Ripple's kind of public to private approach using public ledgers for institutions versus R3 and JP Morgan's private to public strategy build private first, then connect selectively outwards. Both chasing efficiency, but with different philosophies on DLT. Precisely. Different okay. views on how distributed ledger tech should work in finance. Okay, so... No big transformation like this happens without hitting some bumps in the road. Blockchain's no exception. What are the main hurdles these early adopters are still tackling? And maybe the big question, are we seeing signs that a tipping point for mass adoption is getting close? Well, historically, one of the biggest challenges, maybe the biggest, was regulatory uncertainty. The Wild West, as people called it. But that is actually changing dramatically, especially this past you know, six to eight months. The EU's MICA regulation markets in crypto assets that came into full effect last December, December 2024. That gives a single passport regime across all 27 member states. Yeah. Huge for clarity, huge for scaling operations. Right, one set of rules. And then in the U.S., we've seen really significant movement just recently. Here in July 2025, the Genius Act was signed into law. That creates the first comprehensive federal framework for payment stablecoins. Okay, that's big for stablecoins. It is. And the Clarity Act aims to finally sort out the jurisdictional ambiguity between the SEC and the CFTC. The ongoing SEC versus CFTC question. Exactly. So for investors, these legislative shifts, they dramatically reduce that regulatory risk premium that's in hanging over the space. That really is a massive shift from the narrative we used to hear just a couple of years ago. It seems governments are finally catching up and providing frameworks. Absolutely. Regulatory clarity is fast becoming a competitive advantage now, not just a hurdle. Now, other things like interoperability, integrating with decades-old legacy systems, mm -hmm. those are still complex, no doubt. But firms are tackling it, using APIs, doing phased rollouts. Ripple itself is launching an EVM, sidechain Ethereum virtual machine compatible that's slated for Q2 2025. So making it easier to connect with the Ethereum ecosystem? Essentially, yeah. It builds a bridge allows their system to interact more easily with all those apps built on Ethereum, makes integration smoother for institutions maybe already familiar with Ethereum. Okay, so given all that progress, what signal should we be looking for? Things that tell us we're really nearing a true tipping point for widespread adoption across the financial sector, 
What should our listeners maybe note down right now in Q3 2025? Well, the sentiment among leaders is certainly there. Over 90% of global finance execs believe blockchain will have a significant impact within three years. That's a strong indicator. 90%. Mm -hmm. But beyond sentiment, look at the utility. Stablecoin transaction volumes hit U.S. $700 billion per month early this year, 2025. That's massive flow. And crypto user penetration, globally, is expected to cross that 10% threshold sometime this year, 2025. Historically, that 10% mark often triggers exponential adoption growth. Network effects kick in. The S-curve of adoption. Exactly. However, I don't think it'll be one single grand event. It's more likely a cascade of sectoral tipping points. For instance, you could argue cross-border remittances have maybe already passed their tipping point in some corridors. Whereas asset tokenization, while it has that immense potential, we talked about U.S. $18.9 trillion projected by Tommy 33, it's still evolving. It hasn't quite tipped yet across the board. So watch the individual sectors. Yes. For investors, monitoring the pace and breadth of these individual sectors hitting their own inflection points, mm. that'll be key. Okay, let's shift specifically to the investor perspective now. For our listeners keen on understanding the investment landscape, what are the maybe lingering risks or the unknown unknowns that this kind of report perhaps leaves on the table implicitly? Yeah, that's always a critical question for investors, isn't it? What's not being explicitly stated. One key area here, I think, is the discrepancy people have noted between Ripple's narrative of strong partnerships and adoption and its own Q1 2025 XRP markets report. That report actually showed a pretty significant decline, 30 40% in on-chain activity and new wallet creation for XRP. Mm. A decline? How do they explain that? Well, Ripple's explanation is that their institutional clients prefer to do most of their processing off-chain for privacy and compliance reasons. And they only use the public ledger, the XRP ledger, for the final settlement step. Okay. Now, if that's the case, it suggests that the value capture might accrue more to the enterprise software company Ripple itself rather than directly benefiting the public network's native token, XRP. Ah, I see. That's a crucial distinction for anyone holding or considering the token itself. There really is. It changes the investment thesis potentially. And they're also changing how they report that data going forward, aren't they? That feels significant for transparency. Yes, exactly. Ripple announced their sunsetting that detailed quarterly XRP markets report. Now, from an investor standpoint, that reduces public transparency. And it inevitably fuels some skepticism, raises questions about getting clear data moving forward. Okay. What other risks should be on the radar? Well, there's the potential for Ripple's new stablecoin, RLUSD, their U.S. dollar-backed stablecoin, to potentially cannibalize some of the utility of XRP as a bridge asset. Mm. That's something to watch. Ongoing regulatory shifts, while we've seen progress, could still introduce new complexities or rules. Geopolitical fragmentation is a risk you could end up with different non-interoperable payment blocks based on blockchain tech. And then there are the broader systemic risks as this technology gets more deeply embedded in critical financial infrastructure. What happens if something goes wrong? Plus, the ever-present potential for smart contract vulnerabilities or bugs? These are all factors sophisticated investors really need to weigh. Definitely a complex picture. So boiling it down for investors looking at the space right now, Q3 2025, what are the absolute must-watch developments or metrics over the next, say, 6 to 12 months? What should they be noting down today to verify if this narrative of progress holds true? Okay, four key things, I'd say. First, watch for that on-chain volume recovery for networks like XRP Ledger, especially as these permission tools and the EVM sidechain integration get deployed later in 2025 and into 2026. That's key for seeing genuine network utility growth. Right. Is the activity picking up? Second, keep a very close eye on further stablecoin legislation, particularly how collateral requirements and reserve rules get defined. That's critical for market stability and wider adoption. Collateral rules. Got it. Third, monitor the success of XRPL's EVM integration. Is it actually becoming a successful gateway for institutional DeFi? Are institutions using it for more complex financial applications? So the DeFi angle for institutions. Yes. And finally, just continue to track the real-world production-level deployments and those big strategic partnerships. Forget the announcements of announcements. Look for concrete examples like the Santa Dare or JPM coin scale. Those offer the most tangible proof, the verification of whether the narrative of progress really matches the reality on the ground. Excellent points to track. On-chain volume, stablecoin rules, EVM success, and real production deployments. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. Brett and Monica are personas to make content more engaging and relatable, not legal and financial advice.
Do your own research before making any investment decisions. See you next time.